This is Greg Hinton, who's a modern Renaissance man who does a lot of things equally well. He is an actor, a film producer, a screenwriter, a writer of novels, an art collector. What did I leave out, Greg? Oh, am I a Renaissance man or a dilettante? I'm not sure which. <laughs> There's a difference? <laughs> combine all those careers? It's just how my mind has ended up working. I am a different person, it seems, to whoever calls. Um, and I, that used to concern me, and now I accept it that I, I have the time I spend writing, and I have the time I spend um, working with our film company, and I, now I'm spending a lot of time volunteering and just my home life is very important, so. My um, God, do you sleep? Uh, yeah, but I get up at, at 4.30 every morning and my, my chief time to do creative things is between that time and say eight o'clock. That's how I, that's if you, anybody wants to know how to write a book, that's what you do. Writing a novel is, is it just helps one touch history, you touch loved ones, you know, you, you make new friends and you meet old friends on the page. And that's, it's lonely, but you, you uh, being able to, to accomplish that after, after sitting it for four hours is just to feel like you've, you've been with friends is really terrific. Let's talk about your books. There have I thought four, but I'm, I was told just now by you that it's three. First, well, actually it is four, counting Santa Monica County. Well, that's true, with the Santa Monica. All right, the first one in 2001 was Cathedral City. Yes. Now, the second one in 2002 was Desperate Hearts. Mm -hmm. The third uh, in 2003, did it begin, the title begin as Boulder Men? and then get changed to the way things ought to be? It had three titles. The yeah. first was Boulder, no, well, the first was Boulder Men. That was just supposed to be catchy. Uh, what I really consider the title to be is King James Version, because my character's name is King James, um, and my publishing company wouldn't allow that. And so what they put on it, which was not my choice, was the way things ought to be which was the title of Rush Limbaugh's bestseller. And I was really incensed um, that they insisted on the title because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in 2003, right? Right, so okay. three, three in a row. The new one that mm -hmm. has just come out, right? Yes. Is called Santa Monica Canyon. Right. Which all of us in, in Los Angeles know very well and love dearly. Uh, but you've called it a novella. Now, what is the difference? The others were novels, yes? Right. So, a novella is just a short novel? It's a short novel, and actually, I would probably call this a short novel rather than a novella. I think it has something to do with the word count and not to be so specific, but it's about a, it's a, it's a plane ride across the country or a long afternoon at the beach is what this book is. I wanted it to be, oddly enough, a short book, you know, in addition to being a good book, but I wanted it to be a short character piece um, between two people. And my other, um, my other books are ensemble, character-driven pieces, so you've got six or seven main characters and you're tracing their stories now, Santa Monica Canyon has a stunning, stunning drawing, painting, on the cover, on the, uh, the dust cover, by Don Bacardi, who is, as we know, and I, I hope people that see this will know, one of our more famous artists in the Los Angeles area. And how did you get him to say yes? Because, and why are there no photographs or no images in the book. It's only a... a well, as you saw the uh, prototype, which was, um, I wanted 
a painting of Don's as a chapter heading or, you know, in front of each chapter and there are 12 chapters um, because they provided their own, although they weren't painted specifically to relate to the prose, they provided their own emotional narrative that echoed what was going on in the book. Um, what Don's great skill is, is he, he can grab likeness um, just like that, but he can also um, create or recreate your essence. And after sitting for him, I was fascinated. People walk away not necessarily feeling flattered about how they look, but they know he's caught how they are. And I loved that experience. I, I, I was, it was breathtaking. And I met him, I was at a book signing in Palm Springs and it was one of those book signings where it was for Desperate Hearts and it had been advertised and not one person came into the store. And there were buyers but they weren't there to see me so you're just kind of sitting there and you've got your little books and they nervously walk do a wide circle around you which is okay, that's funny. Um, but up walked uh, a guy who is Don's agent and he goes out looking because Don is working furiously. He, he sees a new model every day, seven hours a day, three paintings a day. He does um, acrylic on paper. And so the guy's got to really produce for him. And I had mentioned Isherwood in an article about uh, my work, uh, my admiration for him. And uh, he came up and he said, have you ever heard of Don Bacardi? And I said, well, of course, you know, who, who hasn't? And he goes, well, Don's painting writers, which I think was kind of some flattering thing he was saying. But uh, as a matter of fact, he just painted Annie Prue, and I'm sure he'd love to paint you too. And I said, you're kidding. And he goes, no, I mean, would you be interested? And, and so a week later, I was in Santa Monica Canyon sitting in that famous studio where every great actor, writer, artist um, from the 50s to present day has sat. And I couldn't believe the spot I found myself in. It was truly, because I'd written a book, I got to do that. And as book drawings of the male nude I saw you know that wonderful architecture store art and architecture store down on Ventura Boulevard it might be gone I saw that probably 15 years ago or, or it came out in 85 ish I guess and I it was very expensive and I couldn't afford it and I thought it was so beautiful and there I was you know um, sitting um, in the same in the same place so one of my main characters, the artist in Santa Monica Canyon, is a fictional um, um, model out of that book. Well, I was going to say, what influence did Don Bacardi have on the book? Well, I always loved Santa Monica Canyon, and I knew about its history before. I love Will Rogers Beach, which is below, but Don people who have not have the privilege of sitting for their their portrait. I mean, usually in, you know, in days of old, it, it was only a wealthy person who got to sit for a painting. Um, but to, if you think about it, when is the last time somebody studied you intently for seven hours with no noise except the sound of of a pencil or a brush on paper that no 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 sound just the two of you sitting and i was i was warned that it was you know the session would be long but i didn't realize how peaceful it would be and extremely um meditative it was such an honor huh. um and i and you know, a different person comes every day, so you can't, it's, you got to remember it's not just you, but it certainly feels, like I say, um, it felt, I gained such an identity from that experience. And then he asked me back two more times, which Fabulous. was very flattering. 
he did three paintings, so you'd break um, like every two and a half hours if that add up, adds up to seven. Um, and he would pose you, I make a point of it in the book, uh, he, he would pose you in the more difficult position, like if I sat here like this and didn't move. Um, he'd give you the more rigorous position in the beginning and then you, he would tell you, he would start with your face or however, and then he'd tell you when you could close your eyes and you could sleep, but you would run the risk of your mouth falling open and drooling or, your or head whatever. Over your head. But, but he, he'd pose, he posed me, and I think he does this with everyone sitting and then maybe reclining a little and then, you know, sleeping curled up and then you just fall asleep. Um, so what an amazing experience yeah i he was again the the ground rules which were explained by his agent was just not just very very brief chat and on occasion he would ask a question um, but he's a very shy man he doesn't like to make eye contact until he's working and i'm a shy person and uh, people have laughed about the idea of the two of us spending any time together because it was like we'd both be up against the wall. But it ended up being, uh, as I say, such a lovely experience that he felt comfortable enough that he wanted me back because I gave him a lot of emotion. It's, a, it's an emotional, it's, it's cathartic. You feel, um, you feel joy, you feel sadness, there are times you cry. Um, and he doesn't ask, and he doesn't stop the work, um, but it's like dying. Amazing. Um, your life is flashing before your eyes, or whatever issue you have and up. And this is all done without conversation, that's without, what's so... Yeah, conversation would kill it. Ha! Huh. And he doesn't... Um, a, again, the ability, his best paintings and drawings, and I think that his drawings can hold up against anyone's. His, be his, his best, his finest graphite drawings are, 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 are killers, and the amount of um, precision and emotion that he, he manages is just, it's phenomenal. He never corrects a, a painting when he's completed one. He, he, what, what happens is what happens. Does he ever destroy? Uh, no. He has a wonderful story. He painted Maplethorpe. And, Robert Maplethorpe, right, yeah. Right, right. Uh, and um, he says he, he completed what he thought was an absolute masterpiece and his, um, his brush dripped uh, right down by the side of his face. And Maplethorpe, loved it but it was any he, he just doesn't any he, any he left it as it was but he doesn't touch he doesn't touch the the paintings out. retouch yeah right and what he also does is he asks that you sign the painting and date it he doesn't sign his own work your oh, that's curious your name and the date um and he doesn't the, put bacardi at, no. on the back or anything he did in his earlier work i noticed but he he adopted this. How curious. So yeah, you sign it and huh. and it's on you, you know, uh, so. Interesting. I would think he, you'd both sign it, you know, which would No, be... no, he, he, he signs it. Huh? So. Or, or, or rather, you, the, the sitter, yeah. the sitter yeah. signs it. Interesting. Them. You said earlier, you mentioned very fleetingly that Santa Monica Canyon had a history. What is that history? Well, the history, Santa Monica Canyon is, for people who don't know, it's a very beautiful canyon that um, pours down from the palisade of, um, I guess, Ocean Drive, um, uh, down into a stream-fed canyon that then pours into the Pacific Ocean. And it is um, so, it's a well, if you will, um, tree-lined, a very beautiful. It's been there forever, obviously, 
and it's very temperate. And Europeans loved it when they came. It was like they couldn't, so it attracted uh, people from the silent film industry um, and it attracted artists and writers because um, it was inexpensive to live there and they always had the ocean. There was the mus Muscle Beach thing that was going on, you know, down at Will Rogers and um, Christopher Isher would arrive there kind of in the late uh, 30s and he attracted a great number of writer writers and artists who also came. So it's been the home to a lot of really great artists including Sam Francis and um, um, Richard Diebenkorn and um, Matt M our, uh, Mulligans. The Mulligans yeah, and um, Lee Mulligan and uh, the Eames. Uh, oh, I didn't know the Eames yeah, lived there. The Eames. And then remember, you had David Hockney coming through the door. And an interesting thing that Don told me that I didn't know is that David. I don't know him to call him David, but um, that he didn't start portraiture until after he sat for a portrait by Don in 1965. Um, that was soon after he came here, right? Yeah, that that was something that, uh, that he started after, you know, um, after he sat for Don. Um, I don't, so that, I thought that that interesting. was interesting. Huh. Because Hockney's portraiture is pretty fabulous, and so. I think so, and they're still good friends. They're still good friends, and uh, uh, they, part of the inspiration for Santa Monica Canyon as well is the huge uh, cubist um, double panel masterpiece that Hockney did called Santa Monica Canyon, A Visit with Christopher and Don, um, 1984. Um, and that's, uh, that's a major, major um, painting of of Hockney's career. It was like the, you know, Mulholland Drive and Nichols Canyon and this, and house. this house. This house is on Mulholland Drive and the painting. I call those, um, I mean, those were place love letters to Southern California, I believe, from <laughs> David Hockney. So it was really something. And the Bacardi Isherwood home, which sits up looking down over the hill, which is really a magnificent... Um, and the sea is, I remember, too, yeah. the, the ocean, yeah. Yeah, um, was, was the location for the most famous sought-after salons of the 60s and 70s and 80s until Chris died. Um, everyone wanted to go there. They were the... they made being gay... Chic. Oh, it was... It Acceptable. Was, it was very, very chic to get to go there, yeah. and even... How long, Christopher Isherwood and Don Bacardi were together for how long? Years, right? Yeah, from 19, I want to say like 55 till, till 86, so yeah. for 30 years, 31 years. And Chris actually liked Don's brother first, Don explained to me. Oh, um, that's interesting. And then, uh, but... Uh, uh, Chris and Don ended up together, and their age difference was uh, pretty vast. Um, Don would have been 19, and I guess Chris would have been, what, um, 45 or close to, yeah, mm -hmm. close to 45. And um, uh, Don s set some people off. Uh, he was when you're a young person in a with a mature person you're you're kind of dismissed he had his own talent isherwood was the draw um, famous people were coming um, so don kind of was just you know this is a terrible term but isherwood's bit to some people which is yeah. such an offensive term yeah, yeah. Um, but he had his own talent and he also had Christopher, they loved each other, and Christoph, Chris apparently um, really listened to Don's counsel. And so Don in meetings would pipe up if he didn't like something 
you know, say a stage ad adaptation of Chris's work or if, if, or a screen project or whatever, Don always spoke up and kind of was the bad cop and really um, paid for it um, in terms of people um, uh, taking him seriously. Plus, he was a wonderful artist in his own right. And the book, it didn't, it didn't start out being, it's not about them, but it's about, it's, it's about when we wonder if it's always going to be the one next to us and not us. Or are we always going to be an anecdote to someone else? Or is the story going to be mm -hmm. ours? Mm -hmm. And how do two artists live under one roof, one established, one, yeah. you know, emerging. The younger character who, the, this is kind of like a, the younger character lives with a very famous actor um, and has sidelined his own life because of the secrecy that's required, like an A-list movie star guy. And his father has just died at the beginning of the book. And his boyfriend could not be with him for reasons that everyone would understand, because people would know who he was. And he felt very betrayed by that. And he comes back to California, goes to the beach, and um, he meets an artist who's looking desperately for somebody to sit for him because he too has had a loss. And uh, this is an artist of note and he finds this guy not necessarily attractive but emotively interesting. And so they decide that they'll work together, um, just not thinking anything will come of it. And um, they both give each other back their identities that summer. So um, that's, uh, that would be the autograph, autobiographical aspect mm -hmm. of this. Because I met Don, I got to sit for the paintings. Because I met Don, I got to meet Paul Warner and Theophilus Brown. Because I met Don, I, I got to have this experience and write a book. If people, when you get a book out of like an introduction, I mean, that's, and record it, and you steal from them, because you steal your, you know, I'm intuiting things about him, I'm intuiting things about David Hockney's relationship with Peter Schlesinger. There's so much nuance in the book, but you could read through it and you just go, you wouldn't see it, but I know where it is. You know, I know that people know what it feels like to not be the one who gets attention all the time. Where does one buy the books and the films? Online? You can buy them online. You can buy them wherever books and films are sold. Let's move a little on to cinema. Okay. And in 2001, you co-wrote and produced a film called Circuit. Yes. Uh, and it was about a gay cop or a policeman. Which, and it won the Best Film Award in a California film festival. Did it do any other winnings? The, the, inter, the uh, critics were very good, the uh, uh, I was, reviews. I, I was very proud of that. A.O. Scott um, gave us a terrific, of the New York Times, gave us a terrific review, as did Kevin Thomas of the LA Times. A lot of critics attacked it because it was dark and the gay community some members do not like to see themselves depicted in any negative fashion because they worry about stereotyping. But um, Circuit, the greatest compliment I got about Circuit, which is basically one man's arrival to Southern California and his spiral into a crystal meth addiction. Um, this is the cop? Yeah. He comes, he's going to take the summer off and he comes to visit a cousin in West Hollywood and he gets caught up into what is called the circuit scene, which is the gay equivalent of the rave. I was going to ask rave. what that term meant. It's like a, the gay equivalent of a rave party. And they started out as AIDS fundraisers 
like the White Party in New York, well, the White Party in Palm Springs and uh, different parties with different colors all over the country, and they, they were AIDS fundraisers. But what happened is that they became kind of really charged with a lot of um, drug activity, you know, drugs and sex, rock and roll, the whole thing. And uh, the gay community really kind of came down on raising money for AIDS while promoting self-destructive behavior. So it kind of policed itself on that issue, but they still go on. And uh, But no, we got really uh, trashed by a lot of critics. They, there's also the notion of this, this is a party where 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 beauty and youth are are premium and you don't get to go to the party unless you have those qualities and wealth and um, they're generally um, wealthy white men who attend them so there's this whole there was this whole thing about them that was uh, left many people feeling left out so to have a film called Circuit was a party that you didn't get to go to and it made people angry. I had never been to a circuit party myself until we filmed at one. And the thing I'm most proud of is when I asked for producer credit on Circuit, I hadn't met the company that was financing it because I'd written it and I had producer credits before. And uh, he said, I'm not letting some 21-year-old twink be a producer of this movie. He didn't know that I was 45 and, uh, you know, so uh, I thought I did a pretty good job. <laughs> you weren't a young punk kid. <laughs> no, portraying the life, if I, if I didn't really... I interviewed a That's lot of... That's right. Actually, Circuit is, is based on a very close friend of mine who nearly lost his life to that life. What other films have you produced? Well, I was executive producer on uh, Randall Kleiser's film, It's My Party, which, was, uh, which we did in 1995. And that... Uh, was uh, based on a true story of uh, a dear friend of mine and um, Randall's companion uh, who had AIDS and when he got a, a, a quickly, um, a, a quick moving brain disease decided to uh, to throw a party and at the end of it he wanted to end, say goodbye to his friends and family and then take his life so that he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't have to not be who he was. Of all the films that you've done, worked on, what, what's your favorite? Uh, well, the one that I still want to do, can I say that? I really want to do Cathedral City as a film and we're, we're pushing to make that happen. Uh -huh. And I would very much love to do a small adaptation of Santa Monica Canyon. Um, that would be wonderful. With all the art and the artists and With the things. art and it would it would be again a character piece and mm -hmm. um, and I realize as I say that the the scenes mostly are portraits and I just would like a mm -hmm. quiet, small, mm -hmm. um, intimate movie about the friendship that these two um, strangers form over the summer mm -hmm. in Santa Monica Canyon. Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from it. I think it's so my answer to that is the ones yet to be done. You added as a list of my attributes that I was an art collector and I think that the stairway to heaven falls on a gallery called L.A. Louvre, where Venice meets the sea. And I recall going to the West Beach Cafe with friends and walking over before they got their big gallery. And I went in and there was a Tony Berlant show um, of the little houses. And Kimberly Davis was in there and she was talking to a woman whose back was turned. And this space was very tiny. Apparently had to drive over to their bigger space, and I don't know how they managed to keep people doing that, but she was talking to a woman who was buying 
what looked like. It was a great painting. And I loved the Berlant houses and I was looking, but I would go into the back room. And the woman was saying, I'll have to think about it. And she turned around and it was Lily Tomlin. And Kimberly, I think is just the best, I've told you this, but the best art dealer in town. She knew that I was in no position to be buying a little $4,000 Tony Berlant house, but each person she met or meets that I've observed, she educates them and probably hones her craft as she's explaining it. But she took such care of me that I remember going back when I was in a position to buy and I bought from her and that took years. And I bought a John McCracken plank um, and I got into this mode where the galleries in Los Angeles were so wonderful then because the owners or the directors were willing to talk with you and chat you up and they weren't, I'm sure they wanted to make a sale, but it only occurs to me now that I wouldn't now really want to go gallery hopping if I wasn't a serious buyer because the mood has changed that you shouldn't be wasting their time unless you're serious. And I think it's just really too bad for them. It's not only, it's not only Los Angeles, it's literally all over the U.S. I, and probably into Europe. Po probably. I think that the best show in town is, is these openings of these, of these galleries. And I, I just loved it. And I had a good eye. And I didn't know anybody else. I mean, my friend Tom loved art as well. Um, but I didn't know anybody else who was doing this or who could justify it. I mean, they just were appalled. The friends I had were, I bought a, a small Larry Bell cube and my friends just thought I was an idiot. Um, it's only this big and it was from 1964 and belonged to Ed Jans. And I saw one in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, you know, um, catalog or their big collection. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And then I looked around and I managed to, to find a small one. Um, and studying art and obsessive art or minimal art became what taught me how to write. I feel really grateful to be my age now and I feel that I'm listening to where my, I love this line and I wish I'd made it up, but I really feel that my life I'm allowing my life to take it where it wants to go now. That I, I'm hearing the sirens call and I get up that day mm -hmm. and I do that and I go show up. Um, I mean, this has nothing to do with what we're doing now, but this work, I've been working with um, the homeless downtown and there is an entire political movement that is overtaking this city that is so fabulous to be part of, that's bipartisan and I just went down like to, you know, do something, uh, you know, just something because I was always afraid to help people because I was afraid I would help them wrong, truly, so I wouldn't. And I went down and I just got caught up in the momentum downtown and now it's, it's, it's amazing what I'm learning and what I'm doing. I'm so I just feel like my life is now it it's it's out of control but I'm trusting the ride. I never thought I'd believe it with my hair gone and my waist gone and all of this. I'm so happy to be the age I'm at because I get I believe now is the time because now is the time to really self-determine that I've reached an age where it's appropriate to do it.